Hello, my name is Julian Edgar and I'm the author of this book, Vehicle Aerodynamics, Testing, Modification and Development. What I want to cover in today's video is five mistakes, really common mistakes that people make about car aerodynamics. Let's have a look. So the first one is that it's, it's an absolutely common misconception. Downforce or reduced lift must always give more drag. And you hear people say, gee, that wing must cause lots of drag. Or if you say that you're after downforce on a road car, someone will say, oh yeah, but what about the drag? Well, lift causes drag as much as downforce causes drag. And nearly every car on the road has lift. And so it has drag caused by that lift, what's called induced drag. And so, yes, downforce causes induced drag as well, but you've already got it from the lift that your car has. And so, in fact, reducing lift can actually decrease drag. It all depends on how you go about reducing that lift, but don't fall into the trap of assuming that reduced lift or even downforce will always automatically increase drag. It depends on what you're starting with and it depends on the technique you use to cause that change in the amount of lift or downforce. The next one, you see this one a lot too. Very different sort of group, but you see this one in discussion groups. Someone will say, oh, it's easy to reduce drag and so decrease mileage or fuel consumption. And the quote might be, I'm going to get a 20% improvement in mileage with just a few aerodynamic mods. Well, you won't. Look, if you decrease aerodynamic drag, you will improve mileage, you will improve fuel economy, but the amount that you will improve it by is typically very, very small. Now, some people try and say, you know, a 5% decrease in drag will give you a 3% decrease in fuel consumption. That sort of garbage. You can't do that sort of correlation. It depends on how you're driving, whether you're driving fast, whether you're driving slow. It depends on what your starting point is. It depends on the efficiency of the engine with the changed RPM and, and a whole bunch of things. But yes, if you decrease drag, you will improve fuel consumption, mileage, but usually by only a very small amount. And so look, if you can get a one or two or three percent improvement in mileage by your changed aerodynamics, then you're doing really well. Now there are exceptions to that. Pickup trucks, where you put a sloping topper on the back, a sloping canopy, which changes dramatically the aerodynamic drag of the vehicle, you can do better than that. But on a typical car, yes, you will improve mileage, improve fuel consumption, but only by very small amounts when you change drag. That's just the reality of the physics. Lift doesn't matter on a road car. You hear people say, who cares about lift? You're not going anywhere at 200 miles an hour. But lift can be felt on a road car. And the best dramatic example of that is when you take a road car that's got lift and you make modifications that then give it downforce. And you can feel that change. You can feel that change upwards from about 50 miles an hour, 80 kilometers an hour. At 100 kilometers an hour, 60 miles an hour, it is damned obvious. And as you go faster, it becomes even more obvious, even more pronounced. And if you've ever driven a really good high performance car, a Porsche springs to mind, you, you get this uncanny feeling. The faster you go, the better the car feels on the road. And that's because it has downforce. A typical car, the faster you go on the road, the more corrections you are, the more you just feel uncomfortable. And that's typically because of aerodynamic lift. And so lift certainly matters on road cars, but obviously the faster you go, the more it matters. But don't fall into the trap of assuming it doesn't matter at normal highway speeds. It does matter. Here's one I saw just the other day from a person who was ostensibly an expert in aerodynamics, car aerodynamics. And uh, he went along with the line, spoilers always cause drag. And he, he used this uh, example. He said, a spoiler deflects the airflow and that takes energy to cause that deflection. That energy is, is uh, apparent in increased drag. Well, yes and no. Some spoilers work in that way, change the airflow direction and no doubt increase drag. But other spoilers that change airflow direction can decrease drag. 
It depends on what the, the uh, spoiler is doing, uh, how it is actually set up and designed, and whether it's designed to, for example, increase pressures in front of it, which would reduce lift, or whether it's designed to reduce a suction peak where the air wraps around uh, a corner at the end of the car. Uh, they're two different things. They're both called spoilers, but one will decrease drag, one will increase drag. So spoilers always cause drag is simply wrong. Any of the technical literature will show that. And here's the last one. Wings and splitters are best for downforce. Uh, someone might say, look, I'm an amateur racer who wants better downforce on my car. So of course I'm starting with a front splitter and a wing. I wouldn't. I would start under the car. Under the car, when you change your aerodynamic flows, you have a very big surface area, square yards, square meters of area. And if you can decrease the pressure under the car, because of that big area, you will pull the car downwards very, very effectively. Even formula cars, when you look at the contribution of the underbody versus the front and rear wings, the underbody creates more downforce. You have such a big area to play with, and on a road car or a race car, if you're doing it yourself, because it's invisible, it doesn't matter about aesthetics, because it's invisible, you can do it all yourself. You can do it all yourself very, very easily by making under trays, optimizing a diffuser, and so on. A proper undercar aerodynamic package, not just a tacked on little diffuser on the end from eBay. And I mention that because some people go off and think, oh yeah, the eBay $10 diffuser, that'll give my car downforce. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a proper undercar development. That's where I would start. It also has the huge benefit that most of the downforce is between the axle lines. A wing develops downforce behind the back axle line, which therefore creates front lift, just like a seesaw. A front splitter develops downforce in front of the front axle line, which causes rear lift, just the seesaw working in the other direction. So you've always got to juggle. You know, if you're getting more effective wing or more effective front splitter, you're actually making it less effective at the other end of the car. Working under the car is typically largely between the axle lines, and that doesn't upset the other end. It just pulls the car downwards. So there are five common misconceptions. To avoid falling into those logical holes, here is the book to read, Vehicle Aerodynamics Testing, Modification and Development. It covers how to get downforce, it covers how to reduce drag, and it uses tested, accredited, um, officially authorized, if you like, uh, techniques endorsed by experts based on real research, not just rules of thumb, not just copying others, not just misconceptions like were covered in this video. Thank you.